All right, episode 457 with the Honorable, the Great, the Amazing Dr. Thomas Cowan is brought to you by a couple different products that I want to mention and let you guys know about. We talked about the sauna a little bit on the show, but this is the Relax Far Infrared Sauna, which is a far infrared light that penetrates deep into your skin, deep within your body, and what it does is it helps to pull toxins and heavy metals out of your body and out of your fat cells. Now, sauna therapy has been used for thousands of years by people all around the world to help detox their bodies. What I love about this one is that it helps to detoxify your body from chemicals and toxins and heavy metals in your fat cells, but it also helps to improve your lymphatic system. It helps to increase heat shock proteins, which has a dramatic impact on your immune system health, helps to prevent disease. It helps to increase lymphatic flow and lymphatic drainage. I mean, sauna therapy... I think, I, I do it every single day. I absolutely love it. I, I mean, you guys know that listen to the show how much I love the sauna and uh, those of you that have purchased one keep sending in your testimonials about how much you love it. Uh, so if you want to learn more about what it does, you can watch some videos from various doctors. You can listen to um, interviews we've done on it and watch a promo video um, and listen to some podcasts all about what this thing will do. What I love about it too is that it's affordable. Number one, it doesn't cost two to $4,000 like a lot of other saunas. It's low EMF, but what's, what's really cool is that you can, it's portable. You can lend it to a friend or move it room to room. You don't have to knock out a wall for this. It's amazing. I love it. Check it out. And we're also brought to you by a brand new website where we are going to be diving deep, 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 deep into what's going on with your health conditions. We get so many emails of people asking uh, different questions about their health. And so I decided to create an online private membership community with two amazing people. One is a former anesthesiologist doctor. Another is a naturopath who's been at this for 40 years. So we dive deep and we've got 22 hours of content. It's not launched yet, but it, it will be launching very, very soon. So that one is called perpetualhealing.me. So if you like to check out perpetualhealing.me or the sauna, there'll be links at extremehealthradio.com slash 457. And there's also links in our store for a lot of these alternative and pretty crazy awesome health products too that are available in our store. All right, thanks for listening. Let's get on to the episode. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here on another episode of Extreme Health Radio. Glad to have you with us. We're going to be talking about some really interesting ideas today, and I got turned on to Dr. Thomas Cowan's website quite some time ago, and we're going to be, we're going to be talking about that heart uh, heart health and uh, everything related to the heart today, and his, he's got a great, great website called FourfoldHealing.com, and this is episode 457, so if you guys want to check out anything uh, regarding this particular episode, like maybe his website or his books or anything like that, you can go to extremehealthradio.com slash 457. And let's see, is there any other housekeeping I need to get to? Oh yeah, I want to let you guys know too, we are now broadcasting uh, three days a week. So on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays. So if you haven't already signed up and uh, subscribe to us on iTunes or written us a review on there or subscribe on Instagram or Facebook, any of those platforms, um, please feel free to do that because that way you can stay up to date <clears throat> Excuse me, with everything we have going on. Today, I'm minus my co-host and my wife, Kate. Uh, she had some other um, things that she had to get to today, unfortunately, but uh, so it's going to be me and Dr. Thomas Cowan. Let's see, anything else that I want to let you guys know about? Um Nope, I think that's about it for, for housekeeping. So Dr. Thomas Cowan, he's the uh, author of a book called The Fourfold Path to Healing, as well as the a co-host of the, or a co-author, I should say, of the book, The Nourishing Traditions Book of Baby and Child Care. And he graduated from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine in 1984. After his residency and family practice at Johnson City Hospital in Johnson City, New York, he set up an Anthro, gosh, I can't even say that word. Anthroposophical medical practice in Petersburg. My goodness, I need to learn how to pronounce that word. Um, he served as the vice president of the American Association for Anthroposophical Medicine, and is a founding board member of the Weston A. Price Foundation. And he's uh, 
He's really, really got some interesting ideas to talk about the heart today. So I want to let everyone know, too, uh, some st- stats I dug up. One million heart attacks occur every year, resulting in 500,000 deaths. Coronary heart disease is currently the leading cause of death in the United States. Crazy, right? So we're going to be talking about that in this particular show. Dr. Thomas Cowens up in San Francisco. And thanks for joining us, Doc. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Now, did I get that correct? Are you up in San Francisco these days? Yes, I live and work live and work in San Francisco. And so uh, you went to uh, Michigan State University. And how long have you been on the West Coast? Uh, 13, 14 years. 13, 14 years. Yeah, it's a great spot up there, isn't it? Yes, it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, was I correct in those stats? Because um, I know sometimes you pull stats off the internet, but that sounds about right, about a million that's, heart attacks. Yeah, that's They're, about right, yep. Wow, isn't that amazing? A, a million heart attacks, and are those are those are probably the only only the heart attacks that people um, seek medical. I'm sure people have heart attacks and don't go to the hospital, or or you know. So I'm sure it's much more than a million. I would imagine. There, there is such thing as so called silent MIs, and you usually find them by seeing evidence of people having had a previous MI on a. Echo, uh, electrocardiogram. Mm-hmm. I, I was a, uh, an ER doctor sort of part-time for about 10 years. And so I have read a lot of EKGs in my day. And we <laughs> used to find them, you know, pretty, pretty often. People, you'd look at an EKG and say, when did you have a heart attack? And the person would say, I never had a heart attack. And it, they had clear evidence that they did. So it does happen. Now, what would you see in the EKG that would basically tell you that? Uh, inverted Q waves and sometimes ST depressions. Those are technical terms for different patterns on the EKG that show that there's a change in the electrical af- activity of the heart cells. Now, is that because, I mean, obviously, for you know, people don't go to the hospital for everything that they have. I mean, you would think that everyone who has a heart attack would go to the hospital. But how how um, how common is it for someone to have a heart attack and not go to the hospital or like in, in the case that you're talking about? That's just so interesting to me that people someone could have such a mild heart attack that they wouldn't even seek treatment. Yeah, it. I mean, it doesn't happen that much, but. And I have no idea the percentages or the numbers, but probably three to five percent of wow. heart attacks, people either don't have symptoms or they think it's heartburn or something like that. Wow. And obviously those people don't die, but uh, wow, that's right. so interesting. So how long were you working and doing that? Uh, you know, when I first started my practice in 1985, I was... I started out as uh, doing nutritional medicine and anthroposophical, that's how it's pronounced, by the way, <laughs> uh, okay. medicine. And, you know, like a lot of young doctors at my own practice and trying to make a living and having a family with children, I needed to supplement my income. So <laughs> I, I would work like Friday and Saturday nights in a local emergency room. So oh, I did wow. that for about 10 years. Now, you said you focus a little bit on nutrition as uh, as a young doctor starting out. That's typical. That's not very typical, is it? That is not very typical, nor is it typical to just set out on your own with a solo practice. But that's why I went into medicine to uh, focus on, you know, more natural methods of healing. And I was never enthralled with the conventional theories mm-hmm. or the so-called science or the way that medicine is practiced. So that was pretty much my intention uh, since I was sort of in my mid-20s. Wow. So how did you go all the way through medical school and then you kind of had this idea that you wanted to focus more on nutrition? And it seems like quite a quite an awakening, you know what I mean, where not a lot of doctors obviously focus on nutrition. So did that happen early on in your training, or did that happen after you received your your degrees and all that? Uh, it actually, for me, I the way I tell this story is that <laughs> I had been sort of, in some ways, groomed by my upbringing to be a doctor, but I always hated it because I thought it was 
just not for me. <laughs> uh, and and it wasn't until I uh, joined the Peace Corps and learned about both anthroposophical medicine and uh, Weston Price nutrition that I actually saw that there was a different way to do medicine and so that I could, in a sense, reconcile myself with being able to go to medical school and be a doctor. So I, I was not going to do it if I was going to end up as a normal doctor. Uh, so okay. before I even applied or and went, I knew where what where I was going with this. Not not in details exactly, but generally speaking. Gosh, I have to say, I mean, kudos to you because I can't imagine that um, that being able to go through. Um, all that advanced training and get all those advanced degrees with the knowledge that you're not really going to focus on what you're learning and being sort of um, taught a very different model, the allopathic model, which is so different from from alternative. Uh, gosh, that's amazing that you that you had the ability and, and the and the desire to continue on. Yeah, I mean, I was I had a goal in mind, and you know, just as a point here. I, I, I know that I was described by the professors as somebody who was difficult to teach <laughs> be, because I, what what I ended up doing was, you know, I had to take the tests and I had to know the answers and I had to be confident in what I was doing and, and I wanted to be confident. And so I would typically know the answer. You know, if they said, what do you treat strep throat with? I would say penicillin. Mm -hmm. They asked me what the dose is, I'd say 250 milligrams QID for 10 days. The, the thing that they sensed was that I didn't have my heart in it like everybody else did. Uh. And, and I would sort of like almost glare at them like, what do you want from me? I gave you the right answer. <laughs> like, and, and, and it just would put them in a sort of unpleasant situation. Yeah. Which I guess I sort of regret that in a way. But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I told them what the answer was. They asked me a question. I gave them the answer. Yeah. Well, I mean, what more could they want, right? I mean, yeah. geez. What they more could they want? I, I was good enough at that. I wasn't the best, but I was, you know, good enough. That, that Nobody had any complaints except he's just a little funny. I mean, I wasn't. it wasn't so much that I was funny. I was spending most of my time learning what I needed, what I wanted to know, not what they wanted me to know. And right. only enough to know to get, you know, so, so it was a funny experience for sure. I could imagine. Oh my gosh, I could really imagine. So, um, if just kind of uh, philosophizing a little bit, if the if the powers that be, if the if the if the schooling and all that, if they knew the types of ideas you talk about now, uh, if they if you espouse those ideas, if you had the ideas you have now, if you had them back then, and actually voiced uh, all of that, do you think they would have? What do you think they would have done? Uh, well, I mean, not to sound weird about it, but I, I'm pretty prepared. Like, I'm not going into the things I'm going to say, you know, if we're talking about the heart, the, we were taught that the heart pumps the blood. And I, I am clearly in the camp that the heart does not pump the blood. That's actually ridiculous. Now, they, they obviously, you know, no, no conventionally trained doctor would would agree with me. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I, I'm not coming into this unarmed. So if I have a chance to, I guess you could say, defend myself, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I would do a pretty good job. And I, I don't know what they would say about that. I mean, yeah, you know, I guess you could say, well, you don't agree with what I say. Therefore, we're not going to give you a medical degree. But <laughs> on the other hand, I know what I know how to answer the questions that they ask. I know how to pass the test. I know how to do an exam. In fact, they used to use me as an example of somebody who knew how to question people because I did know how to talk to pe patients, not, not so much doctors. Right. But, uh, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I have I have a lot of different things to say than they think, but uh, I'm not unprepared to defend myself. Yeah, I've heard some of your previous work uh, on YouTube and things and um, and when I heard you talking about the heart is not a pump and, you know, I have heard this before that, uh, that the heart, I mean, you, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but what I've heard is that a lot of people talk about how the, the heart is not a pump, but it, it, um, 
it regulates pressure more of the, and it has nothing to do with, with pumping blood. But uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Cause that to me is just fascinating. So, yeah, it's and just let me put this in perspective. So the reason I think in some ways we're talking about this is because I, I did just write a new book called Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, which is about to be published by Chelsea Green. It'll be out around mid-October. And so that's why I'm spending more time than I used to talking about all things heart related. Mm. and. And the, the book is basically has three parts. The, the first part is kind of my personal story around heart issues, which I, I just did it because I did it, I guess. And the second, the second two parts, in a sense, are more relevant. The, the second part is um, everybody thinks the heart is, is a pump, meaning it, the, it's a pr- pressure propulsion device meaning it pushes the blood around the body. This actually started from a guy named William Harvey in the Mm mid-1600s. And then that has been the dogma of science ever since, is describing how the heart pushes the blood around the body. So the second part of this book is an an absolute uh, refuting of this. And then, of course, I have to describe what the heart does if it doesn't pump the blood. Mm-hmm. and the amazing repercussions that come out of that. So that's the second part. Interesting. The third part, the third part is another dogma, which I would say everybody believes, you know, everybody walking down the street, every cardiologist, every internist, probably every chiropractor, etc. As if you ask people, and in fact, it was even suggested in, in one of your introductory statements, and not to quibble with you, but it's such a common thing that people say you referred to heart attacks as coronary artery disease oh, okay and 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 the reason that's an interesting thing is if you ask people so why does somebody have a heart attack everybody would say every cardiologist every internist every joe blow across the street says well you have these arteries called coronary arteries there's mm-hmm. four of them most some people may not know there's four mm-hmm. they get blocked with plaque the blood can't get through and then downstream from that blockage you get a heart attack that that's why we do bypasses stents angioplasties that's why we've had years of argument over what the best diet for preventing blockages, treating blockages, is it a low-fat diet, is it a low-carb diet, is it a paleo diet, is it a macrobiotic diet, an Ornish diet? Mm -hmm. Everything has been, what do we do about plaque? Because plaque causes the blockages which cause the heart attacks. Right, everyone's concerned about the plaque. Right. The Mm -hmm. third part of the book is a very clear, simple, I hope well-reasoned explanation that the plaque and the blockages and the coronary arteries are at most a minor part of heart attacks. And the reason we still have these million heart attacks and 500 deaths is because we've spent 50 years, five decades focused on the plaque and it's not the plaque. And anybody can prove that if you just actually examine the facts. So, how come they haven't examined the facts? Is it just because of it's this dogma they've been carrying around for so long? Yeah, I mean that's a good, that's a sort of a good question, and 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 it's a complicated question because um, you know it, it. I mean, I can get into that, but it got started in the forties when uh, before the forties, nineteen forties in this country, there was very few heart attacks. And then there was a huge change in diet and change in chemical exposure, a change in lifestyle, change in stress, change in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Around then, it started to be people have heart attacks. And then came in the 50s and 60s, the cholesterol theory. And then they invented bypasses and stents and angioplasties, et cetera, in the 60s and then 70s. Mm -hmm. And the, the whole edifice, and we're talking like a trillion dollar edifice was completely focused on the plaque. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I would point out, and these these studies are on my website, and actually I have a new website on all things heart, which I can talk about, but, but uh, in the early 40s and 50s, the pathologists and the cardiologists actually didn't buy into this coronary artery theory for very good reasons, and then they did autopsies and studies to figure it out, and they said it's not true. This is not the cause. It may be 10%, maybe maximum 20. This is wrong, but they lost the argument, uh, so, and not because of scientific reasons. So when they looked at the autopsies and they were looking at the, uh, at the arteries, the coronary arteries back in the 40s and 50s of these people who had died of a heart attack, did they, in those autopsies, did they notice plaque and say, no, I don't think that this plaque had anything to do with it, or did they not even notice any plaque in there? Uh, maybe it might be better, to, to if we want to get into this topic, to, to give the argument, because uh, th- what you're asking is part of the argument against the coronary artery theory. Oh, okay. So do you want me to just essentially outline the argument against the theory yeah please i'm i'm fascinated because you know everyone i mean one out of uh, it seems like one out of every three or two people have heart issues or or, or die of these types of, of of issues right so so here again let's put it in context so the theory is that you get plaque in the four major coronary arteries that blocks the blood flow and then downstream you have a heart attack that's okay. And everything we do is based on that theory. Okay. It's called the thrombogenic th- theory because the plaque uh, cr- creates thrombosis or blockage. Okay. Now, the first thing I would say to people to think about, so I, I, I heard about this first about 15 years ago. And I, uh, believe me, I didn't buy it at first either. It took me about two to three years of pretty intensively researching the subject before I was willing to go public and say what I thought about it. Mm, okay. So, so, so the first thing is, so if we're talking about plaque, then presumably we're talking about something in the blood that creates the plaque buildup. Correct. Mm-hmm, I mean, correct. It's gotta be something in the blood. It, if it's in the blood and which is why we use like cholesterol lowering drugs to lower the fat in the blood, the cholesterol in the blood. Mm-hmm. So if it's the blood, then it blood must be the same all over the body. So whatever it is that's building up plaque should be the same in the coronary arteries, in the carotid arteries, in the splenic artery, the hepatic artery, the renal artery, all the other arteries of the body. Now, they all have the same amount of stuff, whatever it is, that's causing plaque. Now, right? I would totally agree, and it makes complete logical sense. From their perspective, would they say, no, when the blood gets a little closer to the heart, it starts picking up these cholesterol particles? And Would they no, have an explanation there, there, for that? There's, there's no argument for that at all. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. No, the blood is the blood. Therefore, the spleen gets, the splenic artery gets plaque, the hepatic artery gets plaque, they're all subject to the same, you know, whatever it is, influences in the blood. Okay. Now, here's the interesting question. Uh, so you've probably heard or seen or the numbers you say, there's a lot of heart attacks, right? Mm-hmm. How many people have you heard of or know personally who've had a spleen attack? Good, good, good point, right? <laughs> yeah, the answer I'm sure is zero. Yeah. Or, or a liver attack. Yeah. Or a kidney attack. Zero. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only two organs that get, quote, attacks are the heart and the brain. We call a brain attack a stroke. So the other organs get plaque. In fact, interestingly, the splenic artery, spleen has only one artery, and it gets plaque, but the spleen never has an attack. So the, the first question is, why is that? What what hap, You know why only these two organs get attacks? So with You're, the spleen, is it possible that the blood that is going to the spleen through the artery, um, if that artery is plaqued up, uh, what happens to the blood? Does it still make it through, and the spleen can operate correctly, or what happens in that case? I don't want to take you too far off track, but I'm just curious. Uh, actually, uh, the answer to that is the reason it doesn't have attack is there's something different about 
the metabolism of the heart and the brain than there is all these other organs. Okay. I was thinking maybe it's because the heart is actually physically, you know, it's pumping or it's it contracting, it's doing something, whereas the liver and the spleen don't do that. But you say it's the um it's the metabolism. Something's different about the heart. There's something different about the heart. Okay. Right. That's the first thing. Okay. So this so that so that's the first anomaly. The second one is so then people started looking into it and they started doing autopsies. And this gets into the question that you asked. Mm -hmm. And they examined people who had heart attacks. And these are, again, published on my website. And the range of, of people who, say, had a heart attack in a certain area of the heart, they look at the artery leading to that heart. And the range is somewhere between 18% lowest and about 70% highest of significant amount of plaque in that artery leading to that area of a heart attack. Okay. Which means that in some studies early on, only 82% had no plaque leading to the area that had a heart attack. In the the highest study, it's about 28%. Uh, And interestingly, the, the studies show that if somebody has a heart attack and then dies, they have a low percentage, like 15, 20, 30 Mm percent. And if they live for, say, two or three days, the percentages start going up, which suggests that the plaque buildup is a consequence, not the cause of the heart attack. The plaque buildup is a consequence to what would you say? So, again, something happens in the heart, which I can explain in a minute. Yes. Uh, And that... It's, it's a bit like the analogy I use is a river. So you have a river and then, uh, you know, on the, so people throw debris in the river and it gets a little plugged up. But then some, something comes along like a beaver and builds a dam. And that's like having a heart attack. And then upriver from the dam, you start getting more and more debris buildup. So something happens in the heart and upstream from that. That's when you get the debris buildup. And then we go in and we say, oh, there's debris. So we clean it out. And that's the problem is is actually the dam that the beaver built, mm-hmm. not, the, not the debris. Okay. So something's happening to the heart. Gosh, it's so, it's so interesting because I could completely, it seems like back in the 40s and er, in early 50s, like you were saying, uh, before this whole thing got blown up, you have this nexus point where this idea of, um, the, the cholesterol and all of this causing heart attacks. Um, it, it seems like at that point they had the opportunity to choose what was really causing the heart attacks. But when you can see, it's almost as if they could foresee dollar signs in surgeries and stents and cholesterol lowering medications. And obviously they would, they would go that way. Um, I don't know if they foresaw all that back in the, in the forties and fifties, but my goodness, I mean, it, it makes total sense because I can see how, you know, by regulating cholesterol numbers and putting stents in, you can, you can make so much money that way. Right. Now, the third and probably the most important reason, uh, and, and it's, if you can try to follow along with me. Mm-hmm. So uh, over the years, and I've seen lots and lots and lots of people with heart disease because I've written articles about this, et cetera, and now this book. Mm-hmm. So the typical patient is, say, 50, 60-year-old guy who has some symptoms, uh, you know, he walked up a hill and he got a little chest pain and shortness of breath, goes to the cardiologist and he does an angiogram and he finds that he has a 95% blockage in one of his major coronary arteries. Okay. This is the, ap- this is the absolute typical scenario. He gets told then that if this blocks any more than 95%, he's going to be a goner and he better do this stent or bypass as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah, we hear that all the time. You hear that all the time. Now, let's dissect this theory a little bit. Okay. The the theory is we have four major coronary arteries. That's how the blood gets to the heart. So now we're being told that this guy, and let me just give you a real patient about a month ago, comes in. He had walked up Mount Tam two days before and had a little bit of shortness of breath and chest pain, and that worried him. Mm -hmm. And so then he went to the cardiologist, and then he was told he needed a bypass. 
and came to me. He told me he had a 96% blockage of one of his major arteries. Wow. Okay. So question number one. 96% means he has 4% blood flow to a major area of his heart. How in whatever his name, <laughs> did that guy walk up Seven Mile Hill with 4% blood flow? Well, wouldn't they say that, well, he's got three other major arteries? Yeah, but the three other arteries don't, don't supply that particular area of the heart. Oh, okay. So they, the other three areas might have been okay, but... He would have had a heart attack in that area of his heart. Okay. So that's the first question. The answer is there's no way that's possible. The second thing is, so you mean to tell me that this guy who now has 5% blood flow, if he blocks up even more and now has 3% blood flow or 2%, mm -hmm. that that last 2 to 3% is going to be decisive and that's what's going to kill him. And frankly, I don't buy it because 5% is the same as 2%. It's basically zero. Well, and, and so also if you add on top of that, if this guy is just walking around carrying groceries into the house, no big deal. But like you're saying with this particular example, if he's out there hiking and, and all of that, what that 5% might as well be 2% because he's participating in vigorous exercise from time to time. Right. 5% is zero. Yeah. So blocking from 5% to 2% is of no consequence. That has nothing to do with it. And you can actually prove by angi angiograms that if you have a 90 plus percent blockage, you know, we're, we're sort of told that the blood somehow squeezes through the bottleneck, mm -hmm. which is frankly ridiculous. What, what's happening is and, and I, you can see pictures of this, and I can show you how. The, the heart, you know, the human body and human being is an amazingly intricate system. No, no well-designed system would put all its eggs in these four baskets. Mm -hmm. the, the reality is the, the blood supply of the heart is, is literally thousands, maybe millions of small capillaries which are like a watershed, not a river. Okay. There is a flow, a capillary bed, so that any particular flow down any of the channels is kind of insignificant compared to the overall flow. Now, that it's, makes a lot of sense. So you're saying that there's, there's thousands of these tiny little arteries that are more responsible for, for things like yes. heart attacks. Okay. That's why... The, that's why, for instance, when the Mayo Clinic does a study in 2003, they show no survivor benefit from doing bypasses and stents. Uh, it relieves pain, probably because it, it actually cuts the nerves so you don't feel the pain. But, but there's, there's no you know, lifespan benefit. No, the reason it, is because this is, about, uh, this is about two things. It's about flow which is about the small blood vessels, uh -huh. and it's about the metabolism of the heart, which has nothing to do with uh, the arteries or the blockages. So there has, I mean, it's it's interesting because my, let's see, my brother's ex-wife's father <laughs> um, has, he's got like seven or 10 stents in his heart. And he's like, you know, in his late 70s, or, or I think he's in his 80s now, but he's got seven to nine or ten stents in his heart but um so do you think those stents that are in his heart are just i mean obviously they're i, I don't know what to make of, of stories like that right so what he you know what he has is you know what all these people have is dysfunction of the metabolism of the heart and they have a flow problem meaning the small blood vessels that are supposed to take over the majority of the flow to the heart, in fact, the huge bulk of the flow goes through these small blood vessels, he has dysfunction in both of those areas, which are creating uh, metabolic disturbances and then debris buildup, including in his major blood vessels. I that's, see. That's what's happening. That makes a lot of sense. So there's Okay, so how many of these tiny little blood vessels do you think we have? Uh, you can actually see a picture of them on 
There's a website called heartattacknew.com. Oh, I know about that. Yeah, okay. And if you go to frequently asked questions and then the riddle solution, figure one is a picture of a normal heart with all this myriad network of blood vessels. That's what a normal heart looks like. Now, the other thing that's interesting is we do know that there's risk factors for having heart disease, heart, you know, heart attacks, okay. uh, two of which are uh, smoking, high, high, uh, high blood sugar, i.e. diabetes, okay. and a third is stress. Now, the, the interesting thing about that is particularly diabetes, which is a huge risk factor for heart, heart disease, uh-huh. we know affects small blood vessels, not big blood vessels. Okay. So how is it possible that a disease that we know causes heart disease, uh, but it doesn't affect the big blood vessels, it doesn't affect plaque at all, uh, but it corrodes the small blood vessels, which then affects the metabolism, and that causes heart attacks. We also know that stress, uh, which I can say something about in a minute, uh, that doesn't affect plaque, not that we know of, but dramatically changes the metabolism of the heart in a way that we actually can follow very clearly why that leads to heart attacks. And same with smoking. Smoking is a disease of small blood vessels. That's Mm -hmm. why smokers have burst capillaries on their face, et cetera. It's not a disease of plaque buildup, yet we know that it causes heart attacks or is associated with heart attacks. Yeah, I'm so interested in the stress piece too, but for for um, sake of argument, is it possible that someone could say, because I'm looking at this picture here that you mentioned on on heartattacknew.com, is it is it feasible to say or would it be a good argument against what you're saying to say that, well, there's all of these thousands and thousands of m- tiny little arteries or um, uh, blood vessels going to the heart and and things like that, is it possible that those get filled with plaque and we just can't measure it because they're so small? No. No. Okay. That's, not, that's not what happens. They get inflammatory destruction, usually because of, of inflammation based on high blood sugars. Okay. That, that's the mechanism of small vessel destruction. Ah, okay. There's another mechanism which... Unfortunately, it would take me a long time to explain, <laughs> but there's another mechanism where the, the, you see, we're told that the blood is sort of uniform in the vessels, as if it's, if it's, as if it's just a homogenous layer of fluid with stuff in it. Okay. The, the reality is the blood vessels, because they're hydrophilic proteins, organize a a very small gel layer on their inside, which actually electrically charges the blood, which gets it to move. And that gel layer protects the small blood vessels against inflammatory damage. Uh, And those are the two reasons why the inflammation from high blood sugar and the lack of this so-called exclusion zone, as the blood forms itself into very specific layers, which is, again, not recognized in normal cardiology or medicine. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I want to talk a little bit about the stress you're talking about because, you know, that that to me in in our culture is just massive because, you know, every other person is stressed out of their mind trying to pay their bills or they've got family issues or job or work issues. Uh, So are you saying that stress has a particularly... Um, adverse effect on these tiny little blood vessels? Uh, no, I didn't say that. I said that stress has a particular tendency to cause heart attacks, but not because of the blood vessels. Oh, but in, okay. And if you permit me, I can explain that yeah, in a minute. Yeah, please, please. So when we talk about stress, we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, which has two branches. It has a sympathetic or stress fight or flight branch, which is adrenaline based. Mm -hmm. And then we have a parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, life is good, relax, etc. Mm -hmm. And it's based on acetylcholine. What we know from studies with heart rate variability and years and years of study is that well over 90% of the people who have heart attack have a preceding decrease in their parasympathetic activity, their parasympathetic tone. 
which means that this life-restoring relaxation part of their nervous system gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And then they get a psychological, emotional, or physical stress on top of that. And again, I want to be clear that if you have no parasympathetic decrease, having stress then is just normal. But if you have a decrease in your parasympathetic tone chronically, which you could say is modern life, mm -hmm. then if you have a stress, a, a chain of events happens. So here's the chain of events. Number one, you get increased adrenaline in the local environment of the heart, in other words, in the heart cells. What that does is it shifts the metabolism of the heart from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm. It's called a glycolytic shift. And that creates what's called glycolysis or fermentation. Now, let me put that in simple terms. In other words, instead of generating fuel the normal way, we generate it through fermentation and you produce lactic acid. That's the same thing that happens in your leg. If you, for instance, run too much, then you go, you go glycolytic, you start making lactic acid, and you get a cramp in your leg. The lactic acid acidifies the tissue and produces pain and cramps. We all know that. Mm -hmm. That exact same thing happens under stress in the heart. You start making lactic acid in the environment of the heart. This has been proven by lactic acid assays and by measuring the pH. And again, the studies of this are in my book. Um, so you get a, a acidification of the tissue, a drop in the pH, And just like the leg, that creates pain in the heart. That's what we call angina. Mm. Now, the difference between the heart and the leg or the spleen is if that acid, uh, lactic acid builds up in the spleen or in the leg or the kidneys, the kidneys just stop. The, the legs just stop. You stop running. Your spleen just stops. Mm -hmm. And that allows the lactic acid to be flushed out and the tissue returns to normal. In, in the heart and the brain, and only the heart and the brain, the metabolism can't stop, and so the lactic acid continues to build up. That, again, creates a local acidosis or metabolic disturbance, which then causes what's called necrosis or death of the tissues, and that's what we call a heart attack. Mm, that's interesting. So that would be almost similar to... Like I, I, I'm just guessing here of doing curls at the gym and your, your biceps just starts, it's just, it just feels like there's so much lactic acid and it's cramping and, yes. but you just keep going and going and going. And that would be yes. kind of equivalent. Except if you kept going and going and going until you actually destroyed the muscle. Let's say in that same scenario you just mentioned, somebody said, you can't stop no matter how much this hurts. And actually, they put you on a machine, so your arm still had to do that. Eventually, it would rip the muscle and break the muscle and destroy the muscle. And that's because, at least from what I understand, doing things in the gym, that's a lactic acid buildup. And that's what's happening in the heart, and it's changing the pH. And so it, it, it's probably doing that as a way to protect yourself, right? Yes, exactly. Same with your leg. It's telling you... We're causing pain here because of acidification of the tissue so that you stop doing these curls. So when someone has, like you mentioned, angina or, or one of these heart pains, that's probably similar to what's going on? Yes, and then they stop. And then they stop doing it, and the situation isn't so bad, and so they can restore, you know, they can essentially flush out the lactic acid, and then they go on. But if that parasympathetic activity continues to decrease because they don't do anything to restore it, uh -huh. then the situation gets worse. Now, every time that gets that happens, that angina, you get a slight amount of, of breakdown of the tissue. In other words, another beaver built a dam and another buildup of debris upstream from the dam. So then you get more and more plaque. Oh, so, okay, so when these types of things happen, you have a little breakdown of the tissue of the heart and then more plaque in the arteries as a result of this uh, pH or this 
Angina. Yes. Okay. Now, another thing that happens is when the pH drops, the calcium can't get into the heart muscle cells, which is why heart muscle cells contract. And so the heart goes what's called hypo or akinetic, which means it stops moving well, which is what we see on stress tests. We see a heart that doesn't move well. Now, interestingly, when a heart doesn't move well, that creates shear pressure in the arteries leading to, the, to that area of the heart, which causes the break off of some of the plaque in that area, which was there. And that creates these unstable plaques, which is now what cardiologists think cause heart attacks. Okay, so let me so, make sure I understand that correctly. So when you have this little breakdown of the tissue in the heart, um, there are little plaques that are in the arteries leading to the heart, and those get broken off? Yeah, the, the reason they get broken off is because imagine you have a heart that's opening and closing very well. Imagine you do it with your fist. Uh-huh. And then you take your middle finger, and, you, and it won't contract, right? Okay. Or not your middle finger, because that's not. <laughs> Let's say that's okay. your index finger. So the rest of your fist contracts, but your middle finger can hardly move. Okay. If you have an artery embedded in that middle finger, it creates pressure on the artery by ballooning it out and contracting it. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in a rhythmical, you know, contracting, expanding situation. So now it's in an unusual environment. Mm -hmm. And that breaks off the little pieces, which then exacerbates the problem. So it started with a parasympathetic stress, you know, glycolytic change in your metabolism. Mm -hmm. It went on to build up more debris. It went on from there to not move well. And that ended up breaking off pieces, which is the final piece of the puddle, puzzle. And that's where the cardiologists come in. Unfortunately, that's way down the line. And while it may help a little to you know, put in the stents, et cetera, at that point, you never actually solve the patient's problem, which is they have a disordered metabolism, small vessel disease, and an abnormal autonomic nervous system. Those are the problems. Oh, that is so fascinating. So plaque and cholesterol are involved in this whole scenario, but what you're saying is that it's not the cause like they're trying, like mainstream doctors are trying to say. Yeah, not only isn't the cause, but if you can follow the, the logic of the cholesterol, so they say you have plaque. Why do you have plaque? Well, if you have destruction because of all these other reasons that I talked about, inflammation and not a proper gel phase forming then your body has a weak blood vessel, which it needs to somehow shore up. It's a bit like you have a broken arm and you need to protect it, so you put a cast on it. Mm -hmm. So the body has these weak blood vessels, so it puts a, a cast on it, which is what we call plaque. Now, the plaque is therefore, in a sense, a therapeutic response. So treating it as the problem is, you know misguided at best because it's not the problem it's the response now having said that it's also true that sometimes responses in themselves cause problems mm -hmm. for sure you know the example i give is you get a splinter in your finger and you don't take it out you get pus the pus gets the splinter out but sometimes the pus eats your bone mm -hmm. but everybody knows that the splinter is the problem the pus is the response and even though you sometimes have to manage the pus, treating the pus is never going to solve the problem because the problem is the splinter. So is treating, it, yeah, sorry, oh, sorry about that. Is it safe to say that the body would create, because a lot of people think, oh, cholesterol, I have high cholesterol, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they, they sort of walk around with that kind of mindset that their body constantly has this high cholesterol. Is it, is it feasible? And I'm sure this is probably how the body works. I'm just guessing here, but... You know, maybe it's possible for someone to have a lot of cholesterol in their arteries for, you know, six months or a year because they're going through something very stressful. And then the, and then if you do another test a year later, maybe those arteries don't have any cholesterol at all. Is that possible? Uh, except I quibble with your word use of the word cholesterol. Okay. 
uh, uh, when you say the arteries don't have any cholesterol, the arteries don't have cholesterol. The blood has cholesterol. Oh, okay. Ar- okay. Arteries have plaque. Okay. So, but I think what you mean is the cholesterol will, in fact, vary depending on the conditions that you're under. So if you're under stress, you make more cholesterol to protect yourself. It's not the problem. And by the way, nobody anymore thinks these plaques are made out of cholesterol. That's ridiculous. Don't they still it, teach that? No. They're mm-hmm. inflammatory debris, which okay. has a ceiling of cholesterol on the outside. Okay. That's, that's well-established you know, facts. Wow. So to think that high cholesterol, or, or even worse, thinking that high-fat food, somehow that butter goes and plaques up your arteries, and the plaque is what causes you a heart attack, that's akin to thinking the Easter Bunny is about to save us. <laughs> uh, but so is that, I mean, on our show, we talk a lot about that, and the people that listen to our show are very tuned on and switched switched on, but... I feel that a lot of Americans probably still believe that, right? Uh, I guess. <laughs> I mean, some of them do, but not so many as there were 20 years ago. Yeah, people are starting to wake up to this whole fat thing. Yeah, that's, that's, I tell you, there's a great movie about this called TheBigFatFix.com. Oh. Unfortunately, it's a little too coronary artery-based for my taste. Okay. And, and unfortunately, he still thinks the heart pumps the blood. But he's got all the rest of it right, so I'll give him a pass on those. Yeah, the big, I'm looking at here, thebigfatfix.com. And, uh, wow, but right. he's, he's um, so that's a documentary you can get, I guess. Yes, on the fallacy of somehow eating butter causes you to have heart attacks. Oh, I see, I see. So it sounds to me, it's interesting because, I mean, gosh, how many people are going to the to their cardiologist? I mean, my... Uh, my mom went to the cardiologist, uh, and she's had some, some heart issues. And she, um, she told the, you know, she was trying to wean off, uh, the statin drugs many, many years ago. And when she told her doctor that, her doctor just read her the riot act. Her doctor was so livid and so angry that she was trying to get off these statin drugs and trying to wean herself off, well, you know, without his permission or without his guidance or anything like that. And a lot of doctors are, sort of browbeating their patients, aren't they? Really scaring them in this Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah. Big time. Especially statin drugs. Statin drugs are, you know, uh, I mean, it's it's a big part of my whole practice is A, a uh, you know, it's to the point where, where you know, it's, it's almost like a party game I can play with somebody. So uh, let's say <laughs> a new patient comes in and he has neurological problems or erectile dysfunction mm-hmm. or a, 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 a new onset of cancer. And so the person comes in and says, yeah, doc, I can't think like I used to. And I'm slowing down and I'm tired and my muscles ache. And without looking at the chart, I say, so what's the dose of the statin drug you're on? <laughs> And, and they always look at me like I'm some sort of genius, which I'm not. How did you and know I, that? I say, how did you know that? I say, because the last hundred people in your situation who came to me all were started on a statin drug within one to three years before the onset of this problem. Wow. hundred percent. So I, I absolutely can go out on a limb because I don't want to say, when did you start on a statin drug? And they say, I never did. Uh, that would look like an idiot. Thing. All right, all right. Uh, I, I'm never wrong, and it's not because I'm so smart. It's just very elementary. These are very toxic drugs. It's interesting um, that they are so prevalent, but it makes sense because they're such big money makers. I want to ask you a little bit about um, um, some things about uh, about and furthering al- along in this idea of of cholesterol, but. I don't want to take you too far off off um, off the topic here, but I have I heard something a while back I thought was really inter- interesting. And the person that was giving this talk was saying, "Why is it that we don't get you know heart cancer? Or typically, it's not, you know there there's you, you never really hear of heart cancer." And he was talking about this whole idea of the pH of the heart, and there's something 
um, you know, going on with the heart that's different than any other organ and whether or not that fits into what you're saying, um, in terms of the pH of the heart and cancer and things like that, people getting heart cancers, um, what you are saying is so different. The heart is so different than what we've been told. Yes. I mean, completely different. Completely different. I, 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 I could give you an explanation of why the heart doesn't get cancer. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we have the time for that. Okay. But l- let me just point out, you know, because this is you know, essentially the second part of the book, mm-hmm. the, the key of it is, is once you understand that the heart does not pump the blood, obviously then you have to ask, what is it doing there? You mm-hmm. know, what is the role of the heart? Right. And and when you when you get into that, you start to see that it's it creates this uh, basically this energetic field, which the rest of the body entrains on. And so it's sort of like the conductor of the symphony. Mm -hmm. And because of this powerful electromagnetic field that's created around the heart, which is actually very easy to demonstrate that is not the environment that a cancer can form in. It is also where the warmth is generated. And, you know, we say these things in common knowledge, warmth and love and all this. Mm -hmm. We don't say, I love you with all my foot. I love you with all my spleen. Uh, We say we love you with all my heart. We talk about the heart of gold. Uh, We don't talk about the spleen of gold or anything. There's a whole sort of, history of connection between warmth and this this central conducting role of the heart and warmth is the opposite of this cancer process which is why it's very understandable that the heart never gets cancer so warmth is the opposite are you saying that at certain points um cancer can't grow in an environment that's 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 like actually physically warm or are you talking about a different physically kind of warmth? warm yes physically warm. one of the old treatments for cancer was inducing fevers in patients which was often successful it's called coley's toxins yeah i mean i've heard about that too because that's why a lot of people like yeah. to do these saunas and things like that right but, uh, exactly. wow but okay the, the warmth is generated from the heart so that's that's what you're saying is is one of the reasons why the heart because you never hear of people getting heart cancer. I mean, that's not it's even like those it two words. Exist. Yeah, yeah, those two words don't even go together, do they? No, they don't go together. There is no. There is a one in once a year somewhere in the world somebody has a uh, you know a cardiac sarcoma, but that, even that's just yeah. an anomaly. So what you're saying is the the heart is more like. The regular, like a regulation mechanism, like the like a like in a symphony, where it's just regulating all of this processes in the body. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I mean, I, I could agree with that, but I see my my whole thing in life is to get very specific. I, I don't like to me that sounds. I mean, it's a good try and mm-hmm. all, uh, but it's too vague. Okay, and and just like. You know, this business with the heart attacks, I want to give people not just a criticism of the current theory, Mm -hmm. but outline a very specific uh, step-by-step, you know, approach to why people get heart attacks. It's very clear. And same thing is, I I don't want to be this sort of wishy-washy, and I'm not accusing you of being wishy-washy, but the heart is a, you know, I know that I said that too. But again, in the book, I describe exactly what the heart does. Uh, you know, so it's it's very clear mechanistically and from a bigger picture what it is that the heart is doing there and what it is that it's regulating, so that we can be very specific and even test it to see, of course, whether that's correct. Uh, so it, I don't like I don't want it to be in the realm of, you know, because I hear some people say. Yeah, the heart is a pump, but it's also this spiritual organ. Uh-huh. Well, I don't really know what that means. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I want to be, you know, it, so for me, it creates a vortex. That's what happens in the heart. And how I know that is, is takes a long time to explain. Yeah. So what is the name of your book again? I'm really I'm interested. That's going to be coming out soon. Yeah. And I, if you permit me, I, I, if I can make a little plug here, because I know do. we're getting to the end of the time. But, yeah, please um, do. The book is called Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, and it's published by Chelsea Green. 
And we are, we meaning my family, is trying to get as many people as we can to know about this. And because we and I really believe there's got to be a different approach to heart disease. There's too many people suffering, too many people dying. And so we started a, a website called humanheartcosmicheart.com. Oh, cool. And we're going to be selling the book as, and you know, hopefully it'll be competitively priced with Amazon, et cetera. But that will allow us to fund, you know, our own work into how we can disseminate this information, how we can, you know, get people who agree with this, cardiologists, to speak about it, you know, maybe someday a foundation to make the therapy available for this, which I outlined. So I would really appreciate if people could, A, eventually go to my website, and then B, actually buy the book from us, because that will allow us to, you know, do more things to make this less of a problem for Americans like it is now. Yeah, I mean, there has to be a, a different approach to what we're doing, and I think people are starting to wake up. There has to be up. a different approach. So the website, I just tried to go to it, is is it not live yet, humanheartcosmicheart.com? It's not live yet. Okay, no, so... It's going to coincide with the launch of the book. Okay, and you said that will be happening when? Uh, mid mid to late-ish October, so we're coming up on about a month. Okay, okay, so humanheartcosmicheart.com, and the beauty of these podcasts is that they're archived and we get people listening to i mean we've been doing the show for four years and we still have people listening to you know all of the shows that we started at the very beginning so people will be able to listen to this uh, on into the future um Good. so really quickly i know that you are pressed for time but i wanted to ask you one other question um i'm just thinking about people who uh people like my mom or people like other uh people out there that are you know trying you're trying to do better things for their heart and they learn about the cholesterol and eating butter and how bad that is for you and all or all these things so i'm curious what are some things people can do to build their heart health you probably go into this you know in your book but i'm just curious if you can share some of that stuff so number one they should eat real food um which means a you know paleo-ish nourishing traditions uh, liberal fats, meaning coconut oil, butter, olive oil, um, the right sunflower oil, and that's a, sort of a long sub subject. Mm -hmm. um, low carbohydrates, no processed food, um, you know, proteins, and uh, lots of uh, vegetables and diverse vegetables. And if they want to know more about that, we have a, a website, drcowensgarden.com, which talks about how to eat vegetables, etc. Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing is a, you know, some sort of a movement slash resistance program slash exercise. Uh, number three, they should live life in a way to support their parasympathetic nervous system, not their fight or flight nervous system, which means walking on the beach, um, making love, having friends, human touch, being out in the sun, um, experiencing nature not working at a job that you hate, uh, you know, economic stability, if possible, uh, family encounters, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's number three. Number four is to take, if you have heart disease, you need to take a medicine called strophanthus, uh, otherwise known as wabain. And if you have a bad problem, you need to look into EECP, which is a way to encourage the capillary flow, which is like doing your own bypass. Oh. So those are the five things. Can you, people are listening to this right now thinking, oh my gosh, what are those medications or what are those substances? Where can I get them? So, so how do you spell them and where can you get those two things? The two things, which two things? Uh, the, the two things, the, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so strophanthus is a plant and what it does is it, uh, has an active ingredient called wabain, O-U-A-B-A-I-N. And what that does is it flushes out the lactic acid from the heart, okay. which, which is exactly what you would want a medicine to do. It actually is made by your adrenal gland. It's a neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. And it breaks the linchpin in this, which is the buildup of lactic acid, 
It converts it into pyruvate, which is used by the heart cell as a fuel. So if you can imagine this, it's also in an endogenous hormone, which means it's actually made by our adrenal glands. So imagine this. The, the human being is so sophisticated and, and intricate that it has a adrenal component that will produce this hormone, which under stress flushes out the lactic acid, converts it into a fuel to be used to nourish rather than poison the heart. So that's what the plant, so there's a plant that makes this chemical and it has a long history of use. Uh, I write about it in the book. Uh, the heartattacknew.com website describes it in detail, including the studies on it going back 60 some years. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to get. And I also think that people who want to use it should have a doctor who's well versed in how to use it which includes me and my friend chris mm. uh, so it's not an easy answer to that okay. but that's the reason why we want to start this educational something we're not you know we don't have the details worked out to help more doctors become aware of this therapy help it so people can get access to the medicine more easily instead of every single one of these people uh, making an appointment with me, which <laughs> isn't going to work really. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's, it's just not an easy answer, but that's, that's what we're going to be working on. Okay, interesting. And of those four approaches uh, that you just mentioned, is there a way to – do you think it might be, you know, one may be – more efficacious than the other like um could you know because a lot of times I, I often think about like angry vegans or people who are you know taking care of their health and they and they want to be so healthy and but yet they're angry and they're upset all the time and so i i, I find a lot of, <laughs> i've seen a lot of people being angry and they're drinking their green juice or something and so i'm just curious what your thoughts about are about about where each of these four things would fall in terms of which one is most important I mean, you know, I'm a clinician by trade, right? I see sick people and, and sort of nobody comes to me who's sort of well. You're like, uh -huh. hi, Tom, I, I'm doing well. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Like n nobody comes. They, they come to me because they've had bypasses, they've had stents or they're about to and it hasn't worked and they're scared and they can't walk to the mailbox. That's why people come to me. Okay. So in that situation, I have to recondition them with movement. I have to give them strophanthus. I have to change their diet to this, you know, high, good fat. And those two have to go together. You can't just eat high margarine. Okay. Um, that's not right. No. <laughs> low, low carbohydrate, diverse vegetable diet. And often we have to have them do EECP to make a, a sort of a temporary bypass, which actually will help them for years. Now, you know, through all this outreach in the book, I obviously there's going to be people who are not in that sort of extreme situation and they don't need to take strophanthus yet or hopefully never. And so for them, it's it's living a life that makes sense. And it's hard to describe any more than that. Mm -hmm. But a life that doesn't make sense is a life where I hate going to work every day. You know, you got one life, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people have to, for whatever reason, I get that. But mm -hmm. so they have to do that. They have to have loving relations, if possible. And they have to have a diet like I described in mm -hmm. the book and here. That's yeah. it. You got to do those things first. Otherwise, you're just a regular American and regular Americans get heart disease. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Now, if people are listening to this and they're in other parts of the world, which happens often, quite quite often, all over the world we have listeners, um, or in different parts of the country, are you available? Do you see people via Skype or do people need to come in and see you physically? 
Yeah, I don't see people ver uh, by Skype because mostly I can't figure out how to get Skype to work. <laughs> okay. So I have to have my wife do it. Although I'm sure my office people could do it, but okay, I, I, I'm not a very technophile. I guess. <laughs> so if people um, wanted a consultation with you, they would need to uh, come to San Francisco and see you there. Pretty much. I mean, they should call the office and we can give them options for that. Okay. Okay. So what are the best websites but, but we should? I don't want everybody calling me that i i need to do this some other way right that, that's why we're doing this interesting yeah yeah so if people want to get a hold of you is fourfold healing the best website or dr cowan's garden i guess we could link to all of them on our page here right so the, my practice it gets complicated my practice is fourfoldhealing.com my uh vegetable diversity project slash company is Dr. Cowan's Garden, D R C O W A N S Garden dot com. And the that's live. And the heart is going to be human heart cosmic heart dot com. Okay. Okay. And are you involved with the Heart Attack New website? Because that's a fascinating site too. Only that he's a friend of mine and Knut knows more about this than I do. And and the uh if if there's any uh doctors, cardiologists out there they need to go through that website and then go to the print version and read a report by a guy named Baroldi, who is an Italian pathologist who has been studying this for 40 years. And it's the most comprehensive treatise ever written on why people have heart attacks by a pathologist who knows. Mm. Maybe we should have him on this show. The uh, what, what's his name? Um, Knut uh, Sroka, MD. You should. He's he knows is more about it than anybody. He's written some papers which are on his website. He's written extensively about wabain and it talked about how it's used, its indications, etc. His English is good, and I don't know if he'd be willing to do it or not. Okay, well, maybe I'll get with you off the air and uh, see if there's any way to contact him. Oh, man, this was so amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cowan, for, for spending your time with us today. I know that we went over a little bit. I appreciate your time today. It's okay. Thank you for having me. It's so fascinating. Hang on the line there. I'm just going to close out the show. And uh, I want to thank everyone for listening to this particular episode. And please, if you know anyone who... Oh, you know, is on statin drugs or is getting, you know, stents in their heart or have any kind of heart issues at all, uh, please pass the show on to them. I think it could really help them gain a brand new understanding as to what the heart does, what its actual role is, and how to um, prevent these types of issues. So please pass this show on. And I'm going to put a link to all of uh, Dr. Cowan's websites on our, on this particular show, which is extremehealthradio.com slash Four five seven. So if you go there, uh, excuse me, you'll be able to get access to his websites and everything he has going on. Really, really fascinating stuff. And I think it's high time that we um, start changing our, our views about cancer, heart disease, heart attacks, cholesterol, all of these things. Um, you know, I think it's time that we start listening to people like Dr. Cowan here and start really rethinking. Um, the approach to uh, to true healing for these issues. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks for passing the show on to your friends. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. We'll be back again very, very soon. We're doing three shows a week, so please subscribe and stay tuned to everything we have going on through social media if you want to stay up, up to date with our show. So thank you so much, and we'll catch you guys on the next episode. All right, there you go, episode 457. And we're going to work on getting this other doctor on who, too, from heartattacknew.com. That sounds interesting. So we've done a lot of shows on heart health and we've got lots of different opinions. If you go to our section on the website, you can, you can uh, go there and listen to a bunch of other shows. Let me go there really quickly while I have you on the line here. And, um, Let's see here. If you go to the top of our website of Extreme Health Radio, we're going, probably going to be changing the site here pretty soon. But uh, right now, if you go to find a show, then you have all kinds of different categories there for you. And uh, we have everything from diet and detox to EMF to fitness, our free for all Friday shows, gardening, pet health, survival, vaccinations. Let me find heart health really quick. Okay, there we go. It's on the left hand side under conditions. We've done a lot of shows. Um, on the heart. We did one recently with Howard Martin, episode 453, and he talked more about um, 
sort of the spiritual esoteric ideas of the heart and reconnecting with your heart and things like that. And that was really cool too. Um, we had Tom Lowe. Um, he talked about ultraviolet blood irradiation and how that affects the heart. That was really fascinating. And then we have Dr. Thomas Levy, um, and he talked a lot about the heart as well. And then let's see, we have, oh, Dr. Uh, Kate Ray um, Blue, episode 265. And she talked about vitamin K2 and how that affects the heart. And we've done shows on calcium in the heart and things like that. And Dr. Richard Massey, who's a good friend of ours, um, he, that was that was a good show, episode 210. The tumors and the heart attacks are the body's way of healing. So he takes a sort of a recall healing approach to the heart and talks about the emotional sides of what's really going on with heart disease. And I thought that was fascinating. And then we have Brian Peskin, episode 140, talking about fish oils and heart disease. And how often have you guys heard that... Um, Oh, gosh, what was I going to say about fish oils? I lost my train of thought there. Oh, yeah, well, just like fish oils, everyone says the fish oils, the cat's meow, and, and fish oil, everyone needs to be on fish oil. And if you listen to episode 140 with Brian Peskin, he'll talk about the fish oils, heart disease, and cancer. Fascinating, fascinating, very controversial guy. Uh, but then also we had Dr. Caldwell Esselstein, and he has uh, How to Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Naturally with Diet and Lifestyle, and that was an interesting show. He takes more of a vegan approach and a approach of um, a veganism. And, uh, and so that was interesting as well. Dr. Ken Sutter, Why the Current Medical Paradigm Isn't Working to Cure Disease, Episode 33. And then Dr. Mark Circus, Using Sodium Bicarbonate, Magnesium, and Iodine to Prevent and Reverse Diseases. Gosh, that goes all the way back to 2012. And then we also have uh, Dr. David Steenblock, Using Stem Cells to... Uh, to treat autism, Parkinson's disease, cancer, stroke, cerebral palsy, and more. And then episode 20, all the way back in 2012, my goodness, Dr. Nina Silver, The Rife Handbook of Frequency Therapy and Holistic Health, Using Energy, Vibration, Color, and Sweat to Heal the Incurables. Interesting, right? And then we also had episode 14 with Dr. Bruce Shelton, Is It Possible to Heal Cancer, Heart Disease, Depression, and IBS?, and more using homeopathy. That was back in 2012 as well. So lots of interesting ideas about heart health. I'm curious what you think about Dr. Cowan. I think, my hunch is that in 100 years, we are going to be on board with what Dr. Cowan, Dr. Thomas Cowan is saying. And I think that the reason why we're not, people say, well, why why wouldn't the medical model know about this? Why wouldn't doctors know about it? Well, there's a lot of reasons why doctors wouldn't know about this. Number one, they're too busy. They don't do cutting-edge research. They're way too busy because they have to see how many patients a day do they need to see? I think 15 or 20 or 30 patients, I mean, or more. Maybe it's in the hundreds. I'm just guessing on that, but maybe it's in the in the hundreds where you know, they're, they're seeing a new patient every seven to 10 minutes, and the average time that they spend with each patient is just diminishing every single year because in order to facilitate the kind of lifestyle they have and pay back their medical loans, they have to see so many people because most of what they're earning um, has to go through Medicare and Medicaid and insurance and they're just bogged down with all of these things and so doctors aren't going to know. And then the other reason is, is, that just, is that they're just not taught any of this because if the types of things that Dr. Cowan, if that's true, then, then medical doctors, what are they doing? Prescribing chemicals and medications and poisons and toxic drugs. So what is all that about? And, you know, you can't make a lot of money off supplements and you can't make a lot of money off people changing their life and, and working a new job and, you know, and finding a new partner to be with or, you know, you can't make money off that. So you can make a lot of money off of stents and, and statin drugs and these types of things. And so, um, it's just, it's just, this is the world that we live in. We live in a world where we treat the symptoms and not the cause because you can make a boatload of money off the symptoms. And, you know, if their focus is money, which every pharmaceutical company is, right? And they're the ones that speak to doctors. They're the ones that do all the training for the products and the pills that they sell to doctors. And if the pharmaceutical company's main objective is profit above and beyond anybody anybody else's health then 
that makes sense, right? I mean, it totally makes sense. You know, a doctor is the one that takes the creed above all do no harm. The pharmaceutical companies don't take that creed. And the pharmaceutical companies run all of healthcare, in my opinion. So that's why you're not going to see doctors know about this stuff. And it's only going to take, um, you know, shows like this and, and, and Dr. Cowan doing other interviews with other people and getting this knowledge out there uh, in the mainstream media. And hopefully people over time will start to wake up and start to take care of their own health and start to take care of their own heart health, their oral health, uh, preventing diseases themselves and doing everything they can in their own life to just live a good life and just be happy and healthy and, and live and, and just be, you know, on this path. And, and so that's what we need all people to do. So, uh, if you guys are, are, um, interested in these types of things, we do shows, like I said, three days a week on extremehealthradio.com. So if you want to subscribe to us, go ahead and do that on iTunes or Stitcher. We're available both those places. So you can listen on the go, listen on your, uh, iPhone. Just don't put your iPhone near your heart, please. Uh, or your, uh, breast because. There's issues with the, the EMF fields coming off of these cell phones, but you can listen anywhere on the go, and we appreciate that a lot. Uh, we appreciate all of your support. Don't forget to visit our sponsors for this uh, page or for this particular show, I should say. Um, it's our sponsors and you guys visiting our sponsors and the, the, the products that are in our store and shopping through our Amazon link and sending donations via Patreon. It's all of your support that allows us to continue to put out this type of information because without your support, we would have to shut down. So uh, we don't want to shut down and we have no intentions of shutting down and we appreciate all of your support. Uh, it means the world to us. So we appreciate it so much, whether it's sharing the shows or, or, or purchasing through our store or Amazon link, anything like that. We appreciate it so much. So um, if, again, if you know anyone who is interested, who might be interested uh, in these types of radical new approaches, please pass it on to them. Extremehealthradio.com slash 457. Uh, we love you all. Thank you again for all your support. We really appreciate you. And uh, just know you're doing the best you can. You're trying your hardest, and that's all that really matters. So thank you for listening. We'll catch you guys on the next episode. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a diagnosis of any disease, nor an attempt to treat or prevent any disease or condition. While information in this blog is discussed in the context of numerous conditions, it can be